So, uh, welcome everybody to the first ever episode of Carl's Creep Show. Today we have a very special guest. He has been a producer, a director, a writer, a playwright, an actor. Welcome, Mr. Nicholas Vince. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, Carl. I I know it's really weird when I hear that list being reeled off and I thought, yeah, (laughs) yes, I've done all those at one time or another. Um, You have. Yes, yes, along with, yeah, assistant collector of taxes at one stage. <laughs> and, and a model. <laughs> I'm a model, yeah, yeah, done modeling, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm familiar with your, uh, well, I'm not at first hand experience with it, but uh, yeah, I've read that you did some modeling, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, through your modeling, is that how you met Clive? Yeah, well, it actually, it was actually through Simon Bamford that I met Clive. Um, oh. because Simon and I were at drama school together okay. uh, and I met Clive at a and and basically um, Clive used to live not too far from the drama school uh, okay. where Simon and I were which is Mount View and um, it was sometime after we'd left after we graduated I was at a party in Crouch End uh, where the school was and near where Clive lived and I just met Clive and he asked me if I wanted to model for him. And that's the first work that I did with Clive. I modeled for him. I modeled for the Books of Blood, covers to his short stories, uh, the, uh, the Books of Blood, and uh, and so on. And also, he used to, um, he got me to pose for different characters in the books. I remember posing for Shadwell in The Great and Secret Show. Uh, the, the thing of, you know, Shadwell holding the jacket open and and as if he's you know because whatever shadwell do you know the great uh, not the great and secret show a weave world what am i talking about i I have a uh i have a hardcover copy of weave world actually right right well so shadwell is you know when he opens up the jacket whatever you see inside Mm -hmm. um is like and i this is you know it was an old gag that the the, in the, the second world war the black marketeers used to walk and they used to have the the watches they could sh- sell you inside the the um yeah. the book so um yeah that's uh um yeah that, so that's so it was that kind of thing that i used to do for clive there we go so you met him through simon and for those who yes. don't know uh simon played butterball in hellraiser yes yeah yes. and simon had already worked with clive in the dog company clive um had a Basically, there was a group of friends from Liverpool, including Doug Bradley, uh, who formed the Dog Company, which is a fringe theatre show. And um, Clive used to do the writing and the directing and the rest of the gang used to do the acting. And Clive had seen Simon at drama school and invited him to become part of the Dog dog Company. Um, And, you know, they did shows together. Um, And, you know, that's kind of how Simon uh, started working with Clive. Nice, nice. There we go. Um, yeah, so like I uh, was just mentioned to you earlier before we started rolling on the uh, recording there, uh, mm. you are a supporter of, of indie work. Mm. Yeah, and um, you attend some film festivals and whatnot, and we'll just say a, a couple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a few. No, yeah. yeah, just a yeah, few. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been very fortunate. I think when, because I, I left the acting profession after Nightbreed, um, and then found myself remarkably in debt and had to get a real job. And I did a real job up until 2012. And then when I came back, you know, I realized you know, uh, I got basically made redundant. And I thought, well, OK, well, what do I want to do now? I want to go back to writing. I want to go back to acting. I want to do all those things that actually I really miss. Um, and then I realized that, you know, I'd been doing conventions, film uh, horror conventions over the years. Very lucky to do this and very grateful that people still want you know to meet me and and the rest of the gang and suddenly i thought okay well what can i do to support independent you know basically i wanted to kind of pay forward because clive just you know gave me a he really fought hard for me to play the chatterer anybody could have stood inside the costume but clive really worked hard to get me the part of of chatterer uh, and I kind of, you know, I always feel that I've been very blessed by Clive's generosity. So, and it, Clive's always had that attitude about helping other people. I'm taking it from that. So when I had the chance to help 
and get involved with independent production companies and independent fe you know feature films and so on i really leapt at the chance and it was great i knew it two way street it, they gave me acting experience i can bring a little bit of the hellraiser name with me if you like and i think that helps just raise interest and gets visibility for people's projects and i you know i think that's a great thing to be able to do that's awesome it really is um on the indie scene are there any uh particular films that uh are in your mind underrated and should be noted more and seen more and why not oh that's a really difficult one to, to answer um because mostly i see them at um it's really hard not to answer and just say the ones i'm in um but i think there's particular production companies i'm thinking of thinking of myco entertainment um who i was hanging out with last weekend over in south end on sea um and that's um M Y C H O, uh, uh, Mike and Anna Dixon or M J Dixon, uh, Mike is known as M J. Um, they, you know, my, they've created a whole world of um, of films slash a house and so on. And I was lucky enough to be in one of their more popular ones, a film, a feature film called The Hollower, or called okay. Hollower, not The Hollower, just called Hollower. Um, the, the the work of Ashley Thorpe, who did Borley Rectory, um, I, you know Stuart Spark and, and and Paul Butler from Dark Rift Films, who did Book of Monsters. Uh, I really, honestly, just go onto IMDb and have a look at the stuff that you know, I've been supporting. By and again, that's not just to say there are lots of other people out there. But, you oh, know, yeah. There are an awful lot of very talented ones, but those are the ones off the top of my head. There you go, folks. Now you can. Check out some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So as uh, as Nicholas Vince now as an actor, mm. um, who would you say are some of your biggest acting influences? Vincent Price. Vincent Price. Vincent. Yeah. Fabulous it, choice. Yeah, Vincent Price. Um, I met his daughter uh, oh, wow. end of last year, uh, Victoria, and and chatted with her. It, it, it was really quite emotional. Uh, and she must be really used to people walking up to her and gushing about her father. Um, but I, I, w the way I got into horror was through watching the uh, films of Roger Corman, the Vincent Price, Edgar Allan Poe uh, films. And oh, that's... Love Roger Corman was a fabulous film. Oh, God. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And it, it, I, I think definitely Vincent Price uh, is, um, is, is one of the big influences. Just the... He's so talented and so versatile as well. You know, when he's not playing baddies and madmen, he, he, he's in, oh gosh, and I can't remember the name of the film. It'll probably come to me later in the, in the interview uh, where he is playing the mayor of the town, uh, the little girl who lured the L-O-U-R-D-E-S in France where the girl who saw the Virgin Mary appear and then the um, fountain appeared and people uh, traveled to Lord and they made a uh, song of Bernadette, possibly. Um, and he plays the mayor of the town who doesn't believe. Okay. And it, there's an amazing, there's an amazing, he's a complete cyn cynic about it. An amazing scene where he's obviously so jealous of people who have faith. Yes. And he, and he doesn't have faith. Uh, is ex extraordinary, but you know, Price is just genius as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, you know. he, he really is. He really is. I'm a lot older than what I am in my ways when it comes to, to horror films in general. Uh, original black and white, Lone Chaney, mm. Don Lucosi, Vincent Price, Nosferatu. I mean, those films you didn't need the special effects of today to make those films what they were those films were perfect in my opinion yeah it's a it's a tough one isn't it because i think i was reading an article by an art uh, uh, or i was listening to an article by a guy called joe queenan um who is a new york times writer and um he was talking actually uh, he wrote an article for, for, for the guardian about bad movies and he was saying, you know, he was talking about the fact that he was holding up things like, oh, God, was it Conair or just really, really 
bad movies but he said you know they have to have a lot of money spent on them mm. and uh, and so on now the, the point i'm trying to come back to the point is I'm trying to make is that back in the day black and white you didn't you know that's all people had because they were used to going to the cinema sorry they're going to the theater and then they had cinema mm -hmm. and then you know when you first see the first when you watch the first films they have the character the camera is steady they can't move the character and they're, they're just filming theatrical performances etc so you that you have to get away i mean there is some dracula is a wonderful scene where dracula walks through the web without actually breaking the web that's beautifully beautifully done yeah um, you know so they had a little bit of that stuff you're right I and mean, it's all to do with storytelling and so on these days it's harder the reason i was talking about um bad movies what makes a bad movie movies that have had a lot of money spent on them uh, films that have had you know they've got big name stars in them like the snowman he was is another example he, 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 this thriller that's set in the snow um and it's kind of oh, oh it's gerard butler one about storms or geostorm is the film that he was talking about huge budget movies you know you can have all these things those aren't the things that make them the wrong make them bad movies what makes a good movie is it's got to have heart it's got to have story it's yeah, you know, it's really got to have story. It's got to have yeah. heart. It's got to have talented actors. It's got to have people who are confident. You know, and then your budget really doesn't matter. It just depends what it is you're trying to achieve. Um, I'm working on a werewolf thing at the moment, a, a screenplay at the moment, writing. And one thing I do know about werewolf movies is it's really hard to do a werewolf movie without a really good transformation because that's what you go to werewolf movies for is you want to see a transformation. Mm -hmm. People make a lot of vampire movies, I think, because it's easy and cheap to put in a pair of fangs. Um, yeah, so I think it just does depend. You know, there are certain things that you really do need in order to be able to make a great movie. I agree. Sorry, I, agree. <laughs> I don't know. I just I just found that through my, my journey of, of horror films, uh, a lot of times less is more. Mm less is more and and nothing nick nothing is worse than someone overacting a part yeah yeah and, and people accuse vincent price i don't think vincent price ever did over i honestly don't think so either. no I, you know he didn't roll you know he just played the truth of the character it, okay it's melodrama there is a style of film there's a style of theater called melodrama and we exactly. know where the emotion is very heightened all the way through but yeah, I, I, there is a wonderful film called Locke starring Tom Hardy, where Tom Hardy is the only face you can see throughout the entire film. Oh, all, 90 min all 90 minutes of it. It's literally just him in a car and you hear him speaking to other people on the phone. I think they've got three or four other actors, um, good actors, um, playing a wife. And it basically is about a guy who he makes a decision as a cross he's either going to turn left or he's going to go right at the beginning of the movie movies in the car he's at a set of traffic lights he's either going to turn left or he's going to go right and it you then follow he goes a particular way and it then follows what the ramifications of that decision are and it's literally just tom hardy in the car all the way through so it can be incredibly you know incredibly uh simple to make an incredibly powerful movie it, it can it really can yeah all right, so uh, moving on to some about your writing, actually. Mm. Um, what are some current projects Nick is working on for his writing? And uh, where do you draw your writing inspiration from? Who are some of your favorite authors? Oh, it's Cl uh, yeah, it's obviously it's Clive in terms of writing. When I first started writing short stories, um, I read I reread the Books of Blood. I thought, How do you write short stories? Okay, I'll, I'll reread the Books of Blood. Um, that huge influence. Edgar Allan Poe. Poe. Edgar, Al Edgar Allan Poe is probably the. I've, I've shown this little reach. Look, Edgar Allan Poe. Um, Tales of Mystery Imagination, illustrated by Arthur Rackham. Um, some beautiful, beautiful. I was going to see if I can open up one of the. They are. Hop Toad. Funnily enough, we're talking about Vincent Price. This is Hop. I don't know if you can see it. Yep. This is Hop Toad, which is the mask of the Red Death. 
includes the story of Hop Toad in the uh, film. It's, it's the two stories. Um, yeah, that's probably where I started. I mean, I read, I started reading Pan Book of Horror short stories when I was, as soon as I could get hold of them. Uh, I always read short stories. Um, so as I say, at the moment I'm work, working on a screenplay in terms of writing. I am writing some other short stories, uh, or supposed to, supposedly. Um, I'm just terrible. It's just like there's so many. I've been doing so many other. I've been buying an awful lot of clothes recently because um, I lost a hell of a lot of, of weight recently. So I've had to redo my entire wardrobe. Oh wow! Uh, um, so in fact, there are eleven sacks of clothes ready and waiting to go to the charity store i've had to literally buy everything um so that's mostly what i've been concentrating on in the last two months buying new clothes i've got something to wear um so once all that's done then i can start writing again um i've got a flight coming up on thursday i'll probably do some writing on the plane oh there you go yeah so yeah so there's there's that and i'm also researching uh another thing for the stage at the moment, uh, hoping to have that ready for later in the year. Uh, that's the plan at the moment, but I've got a long way to, as I say, I'm still researching at the moment. Um, I can't really talk too much. That's the terrible thing. I can't really talk too much about them. Oh, that's fine. Right. Close to being, the, 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 I'll and nowhere close to, to being, nowhere close to being finished. <laughs> I'm going to keep my eye open for it, though. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I will. Good. All right. So let's, uh, it's inevitable. I mean, you know, we had to talk about Hellraiser at some mm, point. Of course. <laughs> All right. Um, Hellraiser was your first film role as yes. an actor. Yes. What was it like working with Clive? It was a lot of fun. I mean, it really was a lot of fun. It was hard. It was tough. Um, but you have to understand there was a great feel. I think, obviously... I didn't spend as much time with Clive as I did with um, the, the makeup guys. Yeah. Because obviously Clive was on set directing other stuff. And, you know, we Cenobites kind of locked in rooms. Once, you know, the, the, the other guys had a lot tougher makeup to go through. Uh, Grace and uh, Doug on the first movie. Barbie on the second movie. Um, Simon and I... It was horrible to wear our makeups, but they were very simple masks and they went on uh, very quickly. Uh, but Grace and Doug and Barbie, they had to, have, you know, they had four or five hours or five or six hours of worth of makeup to go through. Oh, um, in the case of Oliver Smith, who played Skin Frank, I think it was 11 hours the first time oh, wow. he had to do the complete skin makeup. So uh, we got to know the guys from Image Animation, people like Jeff Portis, who created the. Um, um, Pinhead makeup. Uh, it was Nigel Booth who did Chatterer. Um, it was Cliff Wallace who, who, from Image Animation, um, and so on. And, and people in and later in Hellbound and Nightbreed. You know, people like Mark Coulier. I was mentioning thinking of Mark at the moment because he's he did uh, he designed the prosthetic makeup for Stan and Ollie, which has just okay. been released. Um, Mark Coulier. Now he was on Hellbound and Nightbreed. I think Mark. I, don't think he was on Hellraiser. Um, so, you know, there were a lot of, basically there were a lot of, oh, uh, John Cormican as well, little John Cormican, um, who, who did the female Cenobite. We got to know these guys and spent a lot of time hang, hanging out with the guys from Image Animation. So they're, and they're, they're all in their late, well, very early 20s, I mean, very early 20s, either 20, some of the guys were only 19. In fact, Stuart Conran, who was the runner on Hellraiser, was only 16. Oh, and wow. I worked with him last year on the offer makeup uh, from Dead Mouse Productions, uh, which is another group I should uh, give a shout out to when you talk about independent. Um, Dark Ditties Presents, which is on um, Prime, which has got um, the first one, the offer, has got most of the a lot of the cast from Hellraiser and Hellbound. Uh, check out there out. There's three of them on Amazon Prime. Some Bamford is in all of them. Um, yeah, so I mean, it basically, it was just a lot of fun because you know you didn't spend a lot of time acting. Um, but Clive is just really interesting to work with. He gives very good, clear direction and and 
listened to you and you know we tried stuff but we're always laughed there's always jokes happening he's got a very interesting mind like when, when it comes to coming up with the concept of hellraiser the yeah. uh even not even in weave world we talked about earlier mm. um yeah i mean the even in passing mentioned cenobites in weave world mm. at one point in, in the book it's not really hit on much, but there's a very small passing on talking about it in it. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't remember it. It's a long time since I've read Weave World. Yeah, so it's a I... very, very um, slight comment made there, and it's a little uh, passing line on uh, uh, Cenobites. Oh, because okay. actually, oh, That sounds familiar. Yes, that does sound familiar. Anyone that hasn't read the novel, I don't want to give it away no. No, 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 no. But uh, yeah. it's a fab fabulous book. Um, yeah, and then he's he, you know, like he's also come out with his uh, tortured souls stuff, like mm. um, fabulous, <laughs> fabulous artistically. Like it, it's oh it's god, great. Clive's Clive's artwork. I mean, apart from the writing, uh, you know, you know, I, I've always Clive's got more talent in his little finger than I have in my entire body, as far as I'm concerned. You know, he's just extraordinary. He really is. And you know his imagination talking to him, he just makes you think. Yeah. You know, he really, you know, having conversations with Clive has always been absolutely, you know, one of the things I really mostly enjoy because he's so intelligent. Yeah. Um, and and interested, passionately interested in people. Um, so it it is always that it just makes you think. And it opens your eyes and makes you look at the world in a different way. I think that's one of the reasons the power of his, his writing is that it, it really does just make you think about what's happening and, and your attitudes and so on. And I, I remember I remember watching a film, I think it was called Seventh Seal off the top of my head. And I told him how much I liked it. And he said, yeah, it's a, okay, it's an interesting film, but what you have to realize that the people who made it in that film is very fundamentalist Christian. He said, you know, and they don't like boys like you and me, that, you know, being a gay man. You know, you know they, they so just really have a think about it, mm -hmm. about what that story represents and, and the whole ethos of that, you know, put that in the context of the real world. Yes, as a piece of art, it's fine. And I, I remember, you know, talking uh, things about that. So, and that's the, what it's like to work with Clive is you're, you know, you're constantly being challenged and, and made to think and he comes up with these weird and wonderful ideas and it's, it's, a, good, just it's a good thing it's a great thing though because it, it hauls the most in you out mm. right? Like he, yeah, he, I, it, it, it yeah. seems like to me I haven't worked with him obviously you have it seems to me like he's the type of man that he can literally haul the best out of everyone Yes, that's that's very astute. That is very astute because he, as I, say, I think, this is why people love working with him. I know Andy Robinson, talking to Andy Robinson um, about working with Clive is just that mind. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's just so intelligent, so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, remind, you know, speaking of interesting minds and other people, it reminds me of Robert Englund. Um, Robert is one of the most intelligent people I've ever met and well-read people yeah. I've ever, ever, ever had the joy of encountering. Because, again, it's just like, oh, have you heard about this? Or, you know, you know, about, have you read this? Or have you seen this artist? Or have you read this book? Or, it's like, oh, then that, that was this. And it's just like the mind going, you know, 900 miles an hour. Um, and it, there is nothing more joyful in that, in, in, my life is is, sorry, is things that make me think um and just think okay yeah no i not thought about it from that angle oh that's oh okay yeah oh wow yeah no that's really really interesting you know and i think that's part of the joy of being alive is when you meet people who challenge you who you just say actually no you're you're wrong oh okay why am i wrong yeah oh okay no i'm not wrong that's no like, you haven't i'm right you're wrong Okay, well, okay, well, and here's my argument. Here's my reason why. Okay, well, that, that's true. But have you thought about this, or have you thought about this? I love that kind of dialogue. Um, or, you know, a certain politician. Um, I was watching them objecting to a wind farm. Okay. And he was appearing in front of the Scottish 
um, area about the wind farm and he didn't want it built and he said you know and the guy said yeah and this guy was giving evidence to the council as to why this they shouldn't he said why no all the scientists agree what scientists couldn't answer because basically it was just his opinion and this guy just had such a colossal ego it's just like okay you're a, you know you have to believe me because i've said it i think this is how the world should be it, there's nothing to do with the reason or argument this is just like it's in my interest that for you to believe what i believe um and because you know you're an idiot if you don't agree with me <laughs> uh, you know it's it's that's not dialogue that doesn't help anybody um um, but it's very easy for politicians to whip, you know, and we've seen what the world is like because of it, um, because it's kind of like, yeah, we're going to play on your fears. We're going to play on, on, on the stuff. It's like, anyway, we, I've done my usual thing of wandering off. Um, what was it <laughs> oh, best? it's good, though. It's good to be able to have a, uh, a good, intelligent conversation, but be mindful and respectful of each other's opinions as well. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I think... But that doesn't mean automatically agreeing with people and just no. I was saying the other day there is the trouble is everyone has a right to an opinion. Well, yes, but you must challenge them. And, you know, just it's like uh, it's like Holocaust deniers or it's like um, global warming deniers. It's saying, yeah, that's an opinion, but actually at least have the common decency to do some research to really understand what's going on mm -hmm. um and to then uh, th these people get far too much airtime as far as i'm concerned it's okay yeah. because it's it's just like it's nuts it's absolutely nuts as far as it. you've got to be able to have recent argument you've got to be able to present it and not feel threatened when somebody can actually prove that you're wrong oh i agree uh, yeah, and, and, and so on. It's a mad world, my masters. <laughs> All right, so um, back to the Hellraiser there. Um, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, that's where we started. <laughs> yeah, I understand that in part one, uh, mm -hmm. Hellraiser, as opposed mm -hmm. to Hellbound, which is part two, mm -hmm. um, the prostheses, the mask, actually, you were blind uh, acting in that. Hmm. Mm, was, yeah, uh, I kind pretty, of had a little. Yeah, <laughs> you, you remember that one, eh? Oh God, oh vividly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I, I mean, I did have a little hole. Okay. My left eye, there was a little hole, and I just below, so I could see some space. I could see the floor. I could see a little bit of floor. I could see about two feet on the floor, but as I couldn't actually move my head from side to side because it was all zipped in at the. In fact, it was supposed to be attached because, um, you know, it's a very high color. Uh, mm -hmm. And originally there's a there's a weird leaf like flap of leather that hangs back. You'll see and hangs at a weird angle at the back. Well, that was because originally it was supposed to attach to the mask at the back. Um, but in fact, that didn't even happen because the mask had shrunk by the time we got to do the first days filming with Chatterer, um, which was the entrance scene, uh, where you meet, you know, you see Kirsty and the and I and he's coming in through that. So when you see Chatterer from the back and you can see all the skin pulled apart and, and the blood on, on on the bone, that wasn't supposed to look like that. Um, it was supposed to be just a, a healed wound, and then the flap of leather at the back was supposed to be hooked into the mask at the back. But um as I said, it shrunk, so they just filled it with blood. Um, it happened a lot, I think, on Hellraiser. <laughs> it looked like oh, it doesn't it look right. Oh, mistake. Yeah, just just put blood on it. I mean, I think it makes it look great because you get this idea that that skin has been torn, and it's you know yep. you can see the skull underneath it, and and so on. Um, and I think that's an even more disturbing uh, figure. But so the original idea was literally all I'd be able to do was literally not be able to turn my head um so i had a little bit of like tiniest but seriously because the, the collar was so tall i couldn't really move my head that much uh from side to side so most of the time i was led around by the hand put it put in the in my position um and then 
you know, I, I think this is why Ashley is brilliant in the scene where the hands are going towards her mouth. She's selling that entirely because I couldn't see what the hell I'm doing. I'm, I'm just basically <laughs> doing, I'm just repeating that action. But she's the person who has to open the mouth and, and let the fingers go in her mouth. Um, so that's all down to her as far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned. Here we go. So which film did you find, uh, I get, well, which film did you enjoy making more, part one or part two? Nightbreed. Because um, <laughs> Nightbreed. <laughs> we'll get to Nightbreed speak, after. <laughs> Nightbreed, Nightbreed, I can hear speak and see. Um, it, they were all enjoyable in their own ways. I, there, somebody was posting online the behind the scenes footage from uh, Hellbound, which you can find on YouTube. Um, it comes in two parts. Um, uh, oh yes, and 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 appears. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know the bit. I, the, this Barbie singing Lieber hair from cabaret and and in, in costume and makeup. Well, in makeup rather than costume. Um, the female sound of light singing. Um, and. We were obviously having a lot of fun. It was just a very different experience on all of those because Hellraiser we made in Cricklewood in North London in a tiny place called the Production Village. Hellbound was made at Pinewood Studios, um, right around the corner from the James Bond studio. Um, wow. You know, big, proper, full-on Pinewood Studios, which is where we also went on to make uh, Nightbreed. Mm -hmm. So very different experiences on all of I remember, I think it must have been... Um, Maybe on Nightbreed, but I remember walking down the corridors of the dressing rooms um, at Pinewood, and my car. There was a dressing room with my name on the door in this beautifully handwritten script. Uh, it disappeared. I kept it for years. Um, this beautiful calligraphy with my name on the door of the dressing room. I'm like, wow, this is just amazing. Um, you know, there were lots of different moments on those on those films. I love all three of them. I'm just very grateful to being part of any of them. Would you ever consider making a remake as Chatterer in Hellraiser? If they were going to do a Hellraiser remake, would you consider coming back? Uh, well, it's an interesting question. My stock answer um, has always been in the past. I put on so much weight I couldn't possibly fit into the costume. I'm now down to two inches from the waist size I was. I'm a 34 inch waist now, and I was 32 when I made Hellraiser. Okay. Um, so, I could, but it would mean shaving the beard. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily want to shave the beard. Would I want to put myself through that again? God, I don't know that anyone would ever ask me uh, because it's likely to be. But would I? I mean, I, if Clive was doing it, you know, would it, it depends. If if Clive, you know, it's, am I available and they get to pay me money? Yeah, I'm an actor. First, personally, so. myself, after Clive stepped back from the Hellraiser stuff as much as he did, mm. it's not the same. It's the same no. when they cast someone else other than Doug to do Pinhead or Hell Priest. In you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, Doug Bradley is Pinhead. You, you've done it eight times. It's really those are really, really difficult. And I feel sorry for the actors, therefore, who've done it. The, you know, the guys who've done it. Yeah. I don't remember the most recent gentleman's name off the top of my head. I met him last year um, at, at, at Texas. Um, lovely man, um, whose name entirely escapes me because I'm tired. Um, yeah, I, I, I remakes, reboots. It depends. If Clive is involved, I'm there without thinking. Um, and if somebody else is involved, it's going to depend on the script and the money and all the usual things that we as actors. And as I say, I'm really attached to my beard now. Um, the thought of having to go through prosthetic makeups, you know, but hey, when I made Hellraiser originally, I had hair. Um, I had long flowing locks in, in those days. But I had hair. Um, so... But I'd love to be part of that franchise again, you know. And, and as you say, if when if it's got Clive at the heart of it, then I think, yeah, we could do First some really interesting Hell stuff. If they were going to reboot any of the original Hellraisers, mm. uh, start with part one and work your way up or whatever. 
Um, yeah, it would have to be original cast. I mean, even down to you guys, like, it'd have to be Clive. It'd have to yeah. be Doug. It'd have to be Barbie. It'd have to be Simon. It'd have to be yourself. Like, have to be Ashley. Like, you know, it... And even if we weren't under prosthetics, even if we, you know, just did small bit parts, you know, other parts. It doesn't have to be under the prosthetics. I, no, the... It, it, it could be a, a concept of uh, showing the Cenobites in their human forms. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, I mean, it's it's interesting. The um, we were talking about writing earlier on. I wrote a uh, a short story based on the idea, of, you know, of, because of course Chatterer converts back to a boy mm -hmm. who apparently so, grew up in hell. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wrote a short story about that that was published uh, last year. Um, and I, I think there were so many good stories in the Hellraiser mythos. Paul Kane and uh, Maria Reagan uh, did a book, a collection of short stories called um, The Hellbound Hearts, in the plural. Um, and there are all the comics. Uh, there, there are a whole load of really, really good Hellraiser stories out there mm -hmm. um, that would serve as really good inspiration for a good Hellraiser film. You know, another good Hellraiser film. Um, and I think that a lot of talented people associated with the franchise over the, you know, over the years who could yeah. really do some interesting stuff um, in different, you know, Andy Robinson. God, I think Andy Robinson back in another. Or Claire Higgins, um, Ashley, uh, you know, all those guys, all, you know, the, involved in some form, all these talented, talented people. Uh, to be involved in these films and, and do something like that. I think that would be really exciting. That'd be phenomenal. It really would. So, hopefully one of these days. We'll one of these see, days. Yeah. We'll yeah. see an original reboot. Yes, we'll see yeah. an original reboot of Hellraiser at some point. Keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. All right. So, let's change it up a little bit now from the uh, the Hellraiser, and we'll talk Nightbreed a little bit. Mm. Now, how as Kinski... Mm. Uh, the change in character from Hellraiser to Nightbreed, uh, obviously there was a big makeup and prosthetics change. Mm -hmm. You could finally see, you could yeah. finally, finally hear, and you had a chance to speak. Yeah. How did you approach Kinski as a character as opposed to playing Chatterer? It's a really good question. Long time ago. Okay, I can tell you for Chatterer, I practiced chattering my teeth in the bathroom. I remember doing that at home. Kinski was learning the lines and thinking about it and just kind of kind of giving him a backstory. Clive then re Clive then wrote backstory for most of the principal characters in Nightbreed. Um, but we didn't get to see those until after filming it completed. Uh, they were published in a thing called the Nightbreed Chronicles. Um, which when I then went on to write Nightbreed comics were very, very useful mm -hmm. because I had all these characters with their biographies um, to, to play around with. Um, how did I approach it? Well, I had to dye my chest hair black. That was an interesting process um, <laughs> because you notice that Kinski's got um, black hair and I was a blonde. Yeah, um, yeah. So I had to dye my chest hair black, which involved a sarin wrap uh, or cling film, loincloth, I remember. Um, you know, and these are the old days when you had to use peroxide. We're talking about the 1980s here when you had to use peroxide to do, achieve these effects. Um, so there was that part of it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, then it, I think it's the... It's just kind of finding the character on the day and the, uh, you know, you, 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 the, an actor prepares. You think about where he's come from, what's his backstory and, and, and so on. Um, it's all there in the script. I think the relationship between him and Pelequin is really interesting. Mm. Kinsk is a wannabe bad guy. He's not a bad guy. No. Pelequin's the bad guy. Kinski is a wannabe bad guy. He's obviously got a big crush on Pelequin, as far as I'm concerned. He's got a real man crush on Pelequin. Um, you know, he's that kind of, uh, you know, when the going gets tough, he tries to warn Boone, run away, just get away and just 
don't destroy this. Um, you know, he just tries to be, or you know, he's, he tries to be the more calming influence on Pelequin, uh, as another aspect of him. Um, but again, it, it, I think the great thing, the the real difference is, and something this is Doug has spoken about, of course, when he was playing Pinhead, he didn't really understand Pinhead till he saw the makeup fully applied for the first time. Okay. And I and I remember that moment as well when I saw Kinski. Um, for the first time you can see what he looks like you can see what the audience is going to see whereas with night with chatterer can't it's a very physical performance a very chatterer is a chatterer is a performance of physical limitation i couldn't hear couldn't speak mm -hmm. couldn't see could hardly move so when so there are no big gestures when chatterer at the end of hellraiser touch it you know pushes la um uh frank larry backwards it's not a big movement because i couldn't do that i yep. i couldn't physically do that and that without possibly hurting andy it's like it's that kind of do me a favor just get out of the way yeah um which actually makes chatter more powerful and particularly as andy's the way andy plays it Mm -hmm. I think you know that's the real interesting thing about Ashley's performance, about Andy's performance, when they're dealing with the Cenobites. The power that you see isn't just from us and the, our performance and the makeup, and those, you know, those incredible makeups. It's the way everybody else is, reacts to those makeups, which I, 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 I always find it very interesting when people, I think it must be harder for actors who are having to do act opposite green screen mm -hmm. because as an actor when you can see the makeup in front of you you can see them you know ashley is reacting to chatterer because that's what she can see in front of her mm -hmm. um so i and and and, and that put, and i think the performance reflects that that's not to say that all green screen act, you know actors opposite i just think their job is harder i think you know yep. they're, they're actors they're playing you know they're playing imagination um so what was the question again? <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going off on my one of my usual long snake-like answers. Sorry. What were we up? Oh, the difference in playing the cut. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Just uh, how did you approach uh, Kinski? Uh, yeah, as opposed yeah. to. And, and I think right? I think that's it. It's just like okay, I can see him in the mirror. Yeah. Um, and again, it's in the script. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the great thing about having Kinski and having dialogue, and then and, and because you can interact, it's in the script. It's always in the script, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with Clive, obviously, um, because you have these wonderful lines like "Move and I slit your throat," "Run while move, uh, or I slit your throat," "Move and I slit your throat," or "Run while you still got legs," mm -hmm. um, which Clive must have given to me on the day we were doing the filming. Because it's not in the original script that I've got, so that must have been something that Clive gave me on the day. Sweet. So and I think that's one of the interesting things of working with writer directors is when you've got them on set. You know, they's like, they can do that. You know, Clive could do that. It's like I'm not only my the writer, I'm the, the director, I'm the writer. Try saying, not that some like, you know many directors will do that anyway if that's what the scene demands. But I think that's one of the you know the pure joys of it. So yeah, it, it's in the script basically. Here we go. Uh, regards to your writing, am I correct in saying that uh, a couple of years ago uh, you did some comics that uh, shed light on the backstory of uh, Chatterer a little bit more? Well, that's interesting. That's the one I was referring to. Prayers of Desire is actually a prose story. It was a couple of years ago. It was part of Hellraiser Anthology Volume 2. Uh, so that's the backstory of the Chatterer, which I, I mentioned earlier on. I mean, I wrote... Hellraiser comics. I wrote Nightbreed comics in the 1980s yeah. uh, for Marvel. Um, I also wrote Warheads for Marvel UK, Mortigan Goth Immortalis. So I, I, you know, I, I wrote monthly comics at one stage uh, for Marvel. Um, then all three of my comics were cancelled in one go and I ended up with an out an income so that's what i actually moved on to after acting i wrote i moved from acting into writing uh writing comics um 
and then when it, all the comic titles were cancelled, discovered I was large amounts of money in debt, and like, oh, I've got to get a real job now, pay off all this job. You know, I've got to eat. I've got to, you know, and I ended up in computers until 2012, because um, that's just the way the cookie crumbled. Um, so yeah, I, 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 it was again. It was just one of those great joys as Clive has always been incredibly generous with his characters um and and the um the worlds that he's created you know he's he said you know I've created this wonderful garden come in and play everybody um so you know not just myself but other lots of other people who had the chance to uh, you know, write Hellraiser stories, illustrate Hellraiser stories. There's been, <laughs> and more recently, there's been Boom comics, and, and I wasn't involved in those for Boom for both Hellraiser and uh, Nightbreed. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, yeah, very lucky gun. Very lucky son of a gun. Now, there we go. Uh, I've got a couple of viewer questions there, if you don't mind. Mm. Yeah. Actually, uh, Steve M. wrote in, and uh, he wanted to know, how does it feel looking back and knowing that you were a part of such a cornerstone franchise in horror film culture? I, I feel grateful. I, I just feel incredibly grateful, and as I say, lucky son of a gun. Um, it's weird and wonderful and incredibly gratifying. Um what I also particularly like is the fact that we get new generations of fans. Mm. Um, I don't know how old you are, Carl, but I'm guessing you weren't born when it was first came out back I'm, in 19... I'm 36. Right. Okay. So you you were born, but yep. probably not going to the cinema to see Hellraiser when it first came out. I seen the original Hellraiser about probably a year after it came out. Oh right, okay. I wasn't very old. <laughs> oh okay, and you're not the youngest I've met uh, in that case. But uh, when we certainly when we made it in this country, it was eighteen only. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we we're not expecting to see. Um, so I think weird and wonderful and and just incredibly grateful. Uh, it's, that, it's timeless, you know, also. It is, and I, I think it touches on so yeah. many different things. You know, Sex, Death, and Starshine is the um, title of one of Clive's books of blood. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, short stories, which is all about ghosts in a theatre uh, and the undead in a theatre. Um, and I think it's got sex, it's got death, um, it's got perversion, it's got a very weird love triangle hellraiser um you know these are all universal th themes um clive is pleasure. Just, yeah absolutely and, and clive is, and, and monsters and what it is to be monsters and who are really the monsters as far as nightbreed is concerned clive has described this has gone with the wind with monsters because it's a love story yeah. it's the love story between laurie and boone is really what you know that that's the beating heart of nightbreed not really, and then there's a whole load of money. You know, what would you do for the man you love? Would you follow him to Midian? Would you follow, you know, you learned he's a monster. Not only is he a monster, he's a monster. You know, this guy is a monster who eat, you know, who, who, who enjoys eating blood and, and twisted and, and so on. The whole, he's also kind of a hero for these people as well. And, and you know, it's very clear that the human beings, the, 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 the sheer neck, Sheriff's Department and the posse are the, the real monsters in Nightbreed. Um, so I, I think it, to, to be part of these things, these universal, these, these stories that Clive's written uh, and, and, and written and directed, etc. I just feel very grateful, very incredibly lucky. That's awesome. That is awesome. Um, I, I, I've always, there's one, actually, is it right here? Uh, no, it's it's on the case of one of the films anyway. Mm. Yeah, and as simple as it is, it kind of makes you think. And I mean, it, yeah, it's aimed towards Hellraiser, but it could also like segue into talking to, about Nightbreed. And as you said, Nightbreed is somewhat of a, a love story at heart mm. of the film. It is. But I mean, uh, with Hellraiser in general, uh, being a young, young gentleman or kid at the time getting into horror or whatever angels to some demons to others 
Right. That stuck with me my entire life. It really did. And uh, I, I started growing up and you, you start looking at stuff as what's right, what's wrong. Is it supposed to be this way? Is it supposed to be that way? It, it is makes real, you think. But also, I think, actually, funnily enough, I think you've misquoted it. I think it's actually demons to some. Some angels. Angels to others. Yes. yes. Which is very really interesting. You know, it's, it's like you know, we're demons to some, but we're angels to others. To others, yes. Yeah, and it, 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 yeah. absolutely. And, and funnily enough, it's the name of one of the short stories that I wrote, uh, of one of the Hellraiser um, comic book stories. Okay. Uh, that I wrote is, is Demons to Some, Angels to Others. Um, it's an incredibly powerful line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is that dichotomy it and is. the flip side of, uh, you know, um, it, it, it's that classic Buddhist thing. Of like, I happen to have a, a coin in front of me. It's two sides of the same coin. Is yeah. that heads or is that tails? Well, it's both. It's Honestly, both. It's, it's, it's both. It, I, you know, you can only see what you can possibly only see one at a time, but it's actually, it's always both. Uh, in every reality, it's always both, unless you should, you know, unless you cut it right in the middle uh, and slice it. So yes, it's possible if you want to be really pedantic, but it, it, it is those that terrible type cutting, and that's what it is to be a human being, as far as I'm concerned. One hundred percent. We have both. Hundred hmm. percent. I find a Clive, no matter what he's done, whether it was books or film or whatever, everything that he puts his hands on, uh, it gives you that uh, that way of thinking. It's it's mm. fifty fifty. Are you going to read it this way? Are you going to read it this way? It's it is. It's he's an interesting man. <laughs> oh yeah, he's yeah. a lovely man. He, as we used to tell him on the, on, uh, uh, <laughs> very very funny, very loving, really really generous, a sick puppy. Um, <laughs> it's good though and I think that line appears on one of the behind the scenes videos is like Rosemary Sylvester Fisher says yeah Clive will remember why Clive's a sick puppy um, it's like yeah yes, it's lovely though absolutely gorgeous there we go alright <laughs> Kim W writes in and uh, she'd like to know is there a film that you've ever watched that uh, has kind of freaked you out a little bit if so, what would it be? It's Diary of a Madman, mm. Vincent Price, mm -hmm. um, where he's trying to explain, and that terrified me. I couldn't get, I couldn't watch to the very, very end. Mm. Um, is that one? probably right out there one the one that gives me the most chills and i'm getting goosebumps now and i just find absolutely fascinating that's the innocence the black and white movie of the innocence mm -hmm. um that's extraordinary and i and i know uh, doug bradley is a huge fan of it as well because we talked about getting to see it at the british film institute in london uh, on the big screen and really wanting to see that big screen experience it, it it's an amazing film, really is an extraordinary film. And if you want to know how to build tension, if mm -hmm. you want to know how to build, and there's extraordinary performances in it and and the, the use of sets, and again, black and white and creepy kids. Oh, mm -hmm. creepy, creepy kids. I mean, growing up, it's going to have been Doctor Who, the Daleks, um they were terrifying i was terrified of those as a kid but yeah probably probably the innocence of, uh, uh, in terms of a film that haunts me still and you just think okay i want to sit you know how do i how do i build tension in a film how's how's this done what's the genius of this film mm -hmm. um it's the it's the innocence it's definitely probably yes it's definitely the innocence awesome now that's a film there now uh for us to check out mm. Mm. absolutely now jamie s writes in and uh she'd like to know how long did it take the makeup and prosthetics to get on uh not specified for hellraiser or nightbreed so okay so, oh. the, so my smart aleck answer is for all of them, at least three months. 
because <laughs> if you put if you take into the from the day that the first life cast is done yeah. In other words, when they cover you in alginate and then plaster of Paris so they can get a plaster cast of your head on which they will then sculpt the makeup. Yeah. That's about a three month process. Um, Chatterer was actually really easy to get. It was really difficult to wear, but Chatterer to put the, 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 the complete process very briefly is the teeth went in. So the teeth sat outside my face. Mm -hmm. They were on dentures, held in with denture grip, uh, which made you salivate an awful lot, I remember. So they put those on. Then they put the mask on for Chatterer, which has got, just got that slit down the back of the head that yep. I mentioned earlier on. That goes on. <laughs> then they cut up condoms, and they use super glue to glue the plastic teeth to the inside of the mask so that when I chattered, the, the lips moved with them. Okay. So it didn't look as if I was just simply moving inside, as if the teeth had just moving inside a mask. Um, and I, and I, I still can't stand the smell of super glue. <laughs> it really freaks me out because you, you, having it that close to your face, uh, and it's all your breathing, and it went into my eye. It was just horrible, horrible, horrible. I hate the smell. I hate yeah, the smell. it's got to be pretty unpleasant. Yeah, it's really not a nice thing to have happen. Um, then there's that, and then, but for um, not, for Kinski for Nightbreed, it was five hours. So a car picked me up at three o'clock in the morning. I was in makeup chair at four o'clock in the morning, through to nine o'clock when I walked on set. Okay. Um, now they're getting in the costume is really straightforward. That's jeans, ripped shirt, and so on. And as Simon has pointed out, and and we must always acknowledge, I just had to sit still, and I do mean sit still for five hours in a chair and not fall asleep because you can't do that when you're having seven pieces. The guys who are apart, who are applying it to me, Neil Gorton and Mark Coulier uh, for Nightbreed for Kinski, um, Nigel Booth on Hellraiser, Cliff Wallace on Hellbound, they are on their feet and they're responsible for painting latex rubber to make sure it looked like, and making sure that... Uh, now, with it, Hellraiser is different because it's the same mask that was... In fact, the mask still exists uh, for both myself and Simon because they weren't stuck to our faces. Mm -hmm. um, they do still exist. They don't travel anymore. Um, they're on... If you go to my Facebook page and scroll down, you'll find an album of photographs of the uh, the Chatterer makeup as it is today. And as, it was like that thick when... We were, I was wearing it wow. almost non existent latex, but they were on their feet, and then they had to scut and they had to get themselves into the studios. And they had to, you know, they're the, we couldn't, it's a complete symbiotic relationship between the artist and the, you know, the makeup artist and the actor as far as the prosthetics are concerned. One cannot do the, do, you can't do it without the other one okay yeah you know, animatronics etc and, VF, and vfx but if you're talking about practical effect um then because to, to breathe a life and give it soul then you need an actor um to do not that they can't do great things without animation etc but there is something if you've got th live action 3d it, it's quite extraordinary thing it's mask work technically um so yeah and I, I i think that so the answer you know i had to sit in a chair for five hours when i was doing that but the the kudos really has to go to the guys who created it clive's vision and then all these artists who he managed to sur surround himself with from image animation in those days who sculpted and then painted and then repainted because Kinski whenever it was taken out in Kinski's case of course they were sticking hair to it as well yeah so there's the beard there's the eyebrows the, the, there's the wig so there's all that to be done as well um so you know because mostly you don't see hair on prosthetic makeup so with Kinski uh the I guess the forehead prosthetic mm -hmm. the the lump area I guess is the, <laughs> I'm not a, exactly yeah, yeah. Uh, what what the proper term would be but uh, was there actually hair attached to that? Was that one full piece? I 
think it was either in total, it's either five or seven pieces in total, and I can't quite remember it now. So there's the chin piece that had the beard attached to it. Yeah. There's the cheek and the forehead. So that's already four. And there's the back of the head. That's five pieces. And it might have been seven. It's either five or seven pieces. Oh, wow. Um, and as each time they were taken off, they were obviously destroyed. Um, they did make a, a one-piece version that was worn by the stunt performer. So whenever there's flame on screen, that's not me in the makeup. That's a stunt performer. Yeah. They don't put actors close to frames. Um, and uh, although I am in the, uh, in the berserker, I play the white berserker ghost um in in that in that costume um so yeah there we go mm -hmm. all right so <clears throat> before we clue up yeah and why not back in october 2018 i gotta go on record and say this i've told you this uh before but gotta do it again Thank you very, very much, sir, for doing the shout out to NL HorrorCon in October past. Highly, highly unexpected. <laughs> Huge surprise and uh, forever grateful. That, that was my pleasure. Thank you for giving me the uh, opportunity, Carl. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be on the first show. Long may those continue. Have fun. Thank you, Thank you very much. And, uh, yeah, so to close it out, don't forget to check out and subscribe to, uh, Will, are you still doing Chattering? I'm not. No, I finished at the end of last year. Oh. Um, so I could concentrate on my writing uh, and, and acting and other stuff. I've, I, yeah. I've done over 100. I can't remember. There's nearly 140 shows. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, Chattering certainly for the foreseeable future. I, I don't see myself doing interview chatterers again. It may, who knows? I never say never again because I'll, ne you know, I'll never know what, maybe round the corner. You never know what's coming down the pipeline. Um, but yeah, so for the moment, I'm just concentrating on, on, yeah, writing. There we go. Well, folks, check out some of Nick's work. Keep an eye out. Uh, he's a very busy man and phenomenal writer phenomenal thank, you, thank you thank you for taking the time out of your day for this don't forget to at least check it out uh check out the chatter uh chattering with nicholas vinch it's uh nicholas vince it's phenomenal i've seen pretty much i would imagine every episode of it <laughs> that was great and you can and you know check out the interviews with doug bradley barbie wilde the jen and sylvia Suska ones i actually Kristen. have barbie and simon um uh, coming up for interviews in another couple of months excellent excellent but also check out the interview with tristan risk yeah your eye your eyes will never be the same again the andrew <laughs> robbins one is uh, i'm all of them I, I, and again if you want to hit, just see it's some really interesting independent filmmakers but stuart uh, spark paul buckler uh the guys i worked with on book of monsters um and so on again just an ashley, the ashley thorpe ones ashley was um, ashley was my first ever guest you know proper official guest on chattering with nicholas Vince. um so yeah there's some really interesting people out there there we go cool i All shall right. leave you so like subscribe curls uh creep show and keep in tune for uh future upcoming episodes thank you very much for watching and nicholas thank you that's my pleasure all right.